So, um, okay, so I'm in Pesto student. This is the exact view that you should also see when you are uh, looking at this. Uh, make sure you read the rules before you start the attempt. And, you know, 10 minutes, it's a pretty tight amount of time. And, but, you know, you do have three attempts because it's a tight amount of time. So uh, let me get started and just uh, um, do this. And I think if there's time, I might do the multiple choice one uh, twice, uh, just so that uh, you can see more range of uh, practice questions. Um, yeah, we'll see where we are at at the end of the free form questions. So just, hmm. Let me set up my uh, hand, by the way, in case I need to write anything. Waste time. I mean, so, you know, I'm going to try to limit how much I write because that's a easy way to run out of time while I'm doing this. Um, but also, when I do need to write something, it's good to have this already. All right, so I'll get started here. And watching the time there. So 5.23 is the time I have to watch as I work through this. Okay, so it says, consider an automobile on a surface road traveling at the speed. Ah, okay. So it is a calculation question, but I think it's simple enough for me to do it in my head. Get on a freeway, speed up to double its kinetic energy. Now, what I am mainly recalling here that allows me to do this as a mental math is kinetic energy is proportional to speed squared. So if I'm doubling this, then speed isn't going to be quite double. It'll be actually increased by a factor of a square root of 2, which is approximately 1.4. And I think these numbers are far enough apart that I can tell which one is 1.4 times 32. I think that's this one. Yeah, so can do this one in my head. Okay, let's get going. Consider the kinetic energy. So, okay, that, oh wait. Okay, yeah, that feels like I need to break, break out a calculator, so I'll come back to that later when I have more time. For an object undergoing circular motion, centripetal force, okay, uh, yeah, does not change the kinetic energy of the object, okay. Which explanation below most correct? Oh, yeah. So the centripetal force is perpendicular to the direction of motion, so it does net zero work at every single moment in time. So... Uh, it is all perpendicular. Yeah, that is it. Um, let me just double check the others to make sure. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. So centripetal force, it can be provided by a conservative force like gravity. But in many setups, situations, it can also be provided by non-conservative force like normal force or tension. But um, it's a key feature of centripetal force has it that it does zero work. It's kind of part of the defining feature of it. Consider three still balls of equal mass rolling down, point A to B. Uh, oh yeah, this is, um, I think, do I have a demo? I think I have a video demo that you might have seen a while back when we were doing kinematics. Um, the fun thing is uh, going from A to B, when, they, when these balls reach B, they all have the same speed, but the amount of time it takes them to reach here is actually different. So let's see here, vertical components of, are the same. No, they are not because uh, they come at different angles. Um, three balls released from A at the same time. They, they don't reach point B at the same time. Their speeds are the same, but uh, like one accelerates first and then slows down. And you know, wait, one, it doesn't slow down, but it doesn't you know, accelerate as much in the second half. Um, so it's a heavier level. It doesn't because gravity, uh, same mechanical energy. They don't, uh, so they do have the same speed here. So their mechanical energy at point B is the same. Um, yeah, this one. They all have the same speed when they reach here at different times. Okay, consider a situation where a delivery driver package oh okay it has numbers but i don't think i need to do any calculation as it is lifted gravity so the gravitational potential energy increase um it yes 
so there are multiple possible answers. I mean, so the change in potential energy, I think this is in the textbook, you know, change in potential energy is the minus of the work done by conservative force. Um, so if one of the choices were gravitational force, then it would have been tricky, but I don't see that. So the other possible choice is, you know, you are just trying to identify the source of energy, uh, which other object does the work that could have put more energy into the um, gravitational potential energy of the package. And well, um, the driver does the work that um, could provide the energy. So I think, um, good thing that it doesn't have gravitational force as one of the possible choices because that would have been tricky. Okay, study of Olympic boxer, show punchy. Uh, okay, I'm gonna come back to this one because I think I need a calculator for this again. Um, a bomb explodes, <laughs> flying in three different directions. Okay, initially at rest, good. Uh, gravity is negligible. Um, which quantities are conserved? Um, so it's a little bit tricky. But this kind of explosion tend not to conserve energy. Like the explosion provides an additional energy that increases the kinetic energy of the object. You know, it comes through the chemical energy and all that. So I'm going to neglect all the choices that says mechanical energy is conserved because that doesn't, uh, that's not the case. Momentum should be conserved because the, the net external force is negligible unless for the explosion. So I think of this one, only momentum is conserved. Okay, conserve two situations, one we are a person moving at some speed. Okay, I don't need to do any actual calculation. So, um, so it looks like the, in this situation, the total change of momentum is the same. So if I'm looking at just the change of momentum, that's the same in both the scenarios. What's different are the amount of time and um, in the chapter just before this week, you covered the hot rate of change of momentum is force. So that's the key thing I think this question is getting at. So uh, this doesn't sound right. I'm going to skip that. Yeah, force needed to stop a person in the shorter amount of time. Yeah, that's greater because it, looking at this chain, same change of momentum, shorter delta T means greater force. And looking at the rest, yeah, impulse is the same because impulse is basically another word for change of momentum. I mean, not really, but it almost interchangeable. And this is just nonsense. <laughs> when a person is coming to a stop, there should be a non-zero net force. And it is just what I call joke choice. As in, it uses uh, technical words, but the way they are strung together doesn't shouldn't actually make sense. Yeah, plate balls. All right, this one looks like it needs some calculation, so I'm gonna come back to that later. Uh, let's see. Okay, this one seems fine. Two cards of identical mass. What is the? Oh, um. So this kind of question. You know, it's going to take some time. So let me go back and uh, I'll just do, do this properly with the uh, explanation of work. And let me just do these calculation questions before. Oh, wow. I don't have a lot of time. Why did I think I had a time of the 526? Um, okay. So, okay. Yeah. I need the kinetic energy. Sorry. Uh, I'm missing the factor one half, but that's fine. I'm just comparing the two numbers. Uh, I gotta, sorry, I thought I had three more minutes than I actually do. Okay, it looks like the astronaut definitely has more kinetic energy. Faster, you know, okay. Um, and here. I think the only calculation I need to do is the, uh, yeah, that's the mo uh, momentum change divided by the duration of time. So 6,000 newtons, okay. Um, 
All right, I'm gonna have to do this more quickly. And question 10, I can just uh, put in the answer. It's something I have memorized. So here I actually need a diagram. So play false, three pieces. Okay, looks like they are mostly similar-ish. Um, one's moving here, that's uh, piece one. Um, the other one moves here, that's piece two. Okay, so the third piece should be moving somewhere in the third quadrant. I think that's uh, uh, this one. Okay, good. Um, so here, how much time do I have? Okay, I think I have, you know, well, so the answer is this. Um, and it's a kind of, the situation is something that you have seen in lecture. And it's one of those where it's nice to have it memorized and whatnot. You know, uh, let me make sure it saves my work so that uh, lose unnecessarily. So you have, this is the situation. Uh, you have something that's uh, coming with some speed. And after the collision, they move together as a 2M thing. And using conservation of momentum, you can work out this one's velocity should be one half of the initial velocity. And when you work out the kinetic energy, your incoming kinetic energy was <laughs> one half mv naught squared. And here, when you work out the kinetic energy, it uh, let's see. Okay. <laughs> um, in this situation here, when you work out the kinetic energy, it uh, uh, one half twice the mass, but one half the speed and because of this square these uh, factors of two don't simply cancel out you have two factors of one half so this ends up being you know one fourth of mv naught squared so the difference between this and this is one fourth mv naught squared so so yeah that uh, um so it, um, yeah I got all the questions. Um, I think about half of the questions I put in this set are uh, questions that I use in physics 10, um, which doesn't necessarily mean it's easy. With the people taking my physics 10 in past semesters, not teaching physics 10 this semester, um, one of the things that made it easier for them is when I'm using a physics 10 question, I think, um, I don't know which of these is a physics 10 question. Um, you, you know, none of these might be physics 10 questions. Um, but uh, for them, their question came from one of the homework questions. Like it should have looked familiar to them. For um, for people in physics 4A, it, it is a new question. So even when it's a uh, same question I use in my conceptual physics class, um, you know, you are <laughs> working it out from scratch. The, um, you, without the benefit of having seen it previously in a homework question before. So, but I think th with the three attempts, that's a, um, you have enough attempts to make sure that, um, that, that what you are able to complete within 10 minutes with the practice between the attempts, it should reflect um, your understanding of physics. So, okay, any particular questions on any of the 10 questions that I, didn't always fully explain because of the time limit. Not seeing any questions. Uh, let me move on to the free form. And uh, after completing the free form questions, if I have more time, I'll give this a couple more attempts, um, at least maybe one more attempt. Because, um, yeah, you know, test to student has a total of three attempts. So test to student can take it two more times. Now, you know, it, uh, once you've gotten 10 out of 10, then any of the attempts you use, uh, there is no risk because it'll, the system will automatically keep the best uh, attempt. So, anyways, let's... Uh, um, yeah, and I think this question pool is quite large, uh, mainly because um, I'm putting into one assessment what could have filled out two separate assessment. So let me, I think I have a big enough pool that I can do this. Um, so when I show you the, uh, so I have a pool of 10 questions. Uh, these come from my past midterm exams. Um, and I could have easily separated maybe some of these 
um, as dealing with just the conservation of energy and the rest dealing with energy and momentum, but I figured I would just uh, put them all in one set and uh, up and uh, set it up that way, I think. Uh, oh, okay. oh, yeah, so. So you'll get one out of those 10 questions <laughs> when you take this. And I do recommend that you, uh, so, you know, the, so normally when people get this in a midterm exam, um, the usual setup for midterm exams was it's a two part exam, a multiple choice part, a free form part, multiple choice, it usually lasts for two hours and, the intent was for the multiple choice part, people would maybe spend about an hour. And on the free form part, usually they get three multi-part questions. And I hope people will have about one hour to spend on that. So 20 minutes that I'm giving here is about the same amount of time people had per question. The uh, difference would be that because you get only one question, it, um, it, it does make them for more challenging pacing because it's not you can control the pacing a bit more easily when you have three questions and an hour versus only 20 minutes and one question so so with that uh, let me just set up my stuff so that i can i'm kind of prepared to <laughs> write down the work as i go so this is my setup uh -huh. is that i think that's fine yeah Okay, yeah, so let me start. It's 5.28, and I'll try to finish this within 20 minutes. Um, yeah. I, I, it's not always... What? Oh, sorry, I clicked on the wrong thing. Um, still 5.28, start. Um, when I'm trying to explain, I'm not always able to finish everything in 20 minutes. But, you know, for me, I do have the benefit of um, being super familiar with these questions. <laughs> Like looking at this, I already recognize this as one of the EGR questions because it doesn't involve conservation of momentum. Um, but l let me work it out. So it says a block of some mass slides down an incline of some length. Um, some rest at the top, at the bottom, it is recorded to be moving at speed of V. Okay. Um, Assuming that the incline is frictionless, what should be the speed of V of the mass at? Hmm. Okay, if it's a frictionless, then energy should be conserved. So let's just start up with that. Um, use conservation of energy. Just, it, it, just the, uh, looking at this setup, visualizing it, thinking about it, it feels to me like energy should be conserved. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, so the condition for conservation of mechanical energy is that no non-conservative force does uh, net work. So, so here, I don't really have to draw a free body diagram, but a free body diagram can help uh, figuring out if there are any non-conservative forces doing work. So if I'm looking at the free body diagram of the block, there should be gravity on it. There should be normal force on it, and there might have been friction force on it. But the question is telling me, don't worry about friction. So I'm looking at gravity and normal force. Gravity is conservative force, so I'm good there. Normal force is not a conservative force. It could have done work. But I recognize with a block sliding down this way, it's perpendicular to the displacement. So normal force isn't going to be doing any work. So. I'm using conservation of energy. So when you're using conservation of energy, um, you need some snapshots to, um, because what conservation law allows you to do is say that this particular quantity has a value at one point in time, has another value, at, or it has another expression at another moment in time, and those two are equal. I can set them equal and get an equation that way. So the snapshots that I should be using is, um, so I should be using the snapshot at the top and the snapshot at the bottom. Those will be two places where I'm looking at the mass, get an expression for uh, its total mechanical energy and um, see where that leads. So I say the total energy at the top 
is equal to total energy at the bottom. Just the statement. And I break out the different portions of the total energy. So uh, there's the kinetic energy and the uh, potential energy. And depending on the setup, potential energy itself might be broken into gravitational and spring potential energy. Here's just the gravitational potential energy. At the bottom, I still have kinetic energy and potential energy. I'm just writing these out to make sure I don't forget anything. And let me now write out the actual explicit expressions for these. So kinetic energy should be one half mass times its speed squared, speed at the top squared, plus its potential energy. That should be mass times g times the height. Um, I don't see height labeled, but I'll work that out in a bit. That's equal to uh, height at the top. <laughs> and uh, the expression at the bottom should be one half mass times the speed at the bottom squared plus then the same thing, mass times g times height at the bottom. And, you know, some of these expressions I wrote, they're actually zero because it says the mass is starting from rest at the top. So at the top, its speed is zero, kinetic energy is zero. And uh, so I could have actually crossed it out here. I just wanted to make sure I'm not rushing through. Um, and at the bottom, you know, I can just set my height to be equal to zero at the bottom. That'll simplify some of my expressions by letting me just say, okay, this is zero by setting a reference that way. And with that reference, this is the picture I have, you know, this is the geometry of the setup. I'm given this length here and this angle here. And I have set this uh, uh, bottom of the incline to be uh, height equal to zero. So the height at the top is really this side of the triangle. So, you know, Look at the look at my right triangle, opposite side. I know the hypotenuse. So the height here should be equal to the hypotenuse times the sine theta. So I'm gonna be using that there. So let me write down a cleaned up version of that expression to see if uh, it is everything. So mg instead of h1, I'll write this in L sine theta is equal to one half m and this v2 would be the speed at the bottom so v squared looking at my equation i have one equation and i count my unknowns see what quantities i don't know uh, m l and theta are a lot of quantities so these are fine g is a physical constant so i can assume that i know it um, v is the sole unknown, which uh, which now I can solve for. So let me do that. M's cancel. Solving for V. I'm just going to do the algebra in my head. When you do that, it ends up being square root of 2 times GL sine theta. Uh, you can check the units to make sure that you did algebra correctly. G is meters per second squared. L is unit of meters, so it has unit of meter squared per second squared, square root it, that's unit of meter per second. So all that checks up. Um, so yeah, that's my expression for V. So in terms of the answer here, I would type in speed of the mass at the bottom of the incline is square root of two times G times L times the sine theta. And uh, if you are ever not sure how you should type in your mathematical expressions, the one at website, I might recommend is ASCIIMath.org. Um, you are allowed to use it. I, it. All it does is it kind of gives you some reference for how to type in mathematical expressions. So, so the, what I typed there, it renders like this, which hopefully looks familiar to people. So, so yeah, that's uh, my answer, and this is the work I'll be attaching. Um, moving on. The part B, it says the mass is recorded to be moving at that speed. Hmm. Let me just double check something real quick to see if, uh, um, well, you know, I just worked out V, so let's test it. Um, so um, I have, let me first type in 2 times G, 9.8 times L three meters um, times sine of 15 degrees. 
Okay, so all of that is the quantity under the square root. So equals and then square root. I get 3.90 meter per second, which is not 2.59. So um, yeah, what is the friction coefficient between the incline and the block? All right. Um, so so now we are uh, modifying what we had before. So before we said so you know this was the free body diagram we were using before um, where they said ignore the friction and I guess we're not working under that assumption anymore. Instead, now we have um, now we have to worry about the friction. So now we will have friction force acting this way. All right, I think it's probably useful to just work out an expression for friction force because it's asking me about the friction coefficient. And um, I can relate the friction force to some uh, friction coefficient. If you look up your kinetic friction, kine so if, assuming this is kinetic friction, which I guess it should be, otherwise it won't be sliding. Kinetic friction is equal given by the coefficient times the normal force. So this is one of those setups where, oh, I need to figure out the normal force. And uh, you might have, you might, you know, this is kind of a standard setup. So maybe you uh, remember what the formula for the normal force should be. If you have it memorized, then great. Uh, feel free to use it, um, you know, just to uh, let me know where it comes from in your work. Now, if not, then this is a place where you have to do a mini standard strategy um, a question to kind of solve uh, for this friction force because I'm going to need that to uh, relate it to the friction coefficient. So let me do that here. I'm going to use this axis. So I drew a free body diagram, step number one. Step number two, I'm defining my coordinate axis along the direction of acceleration. <laughs> step number three, okay, I got to break down my forces, which is just the gravity. It's going to have this component and this component. And um, having done this problem many, many times, I know this angle theta ends up being same as this angle theta. <laughs> so this side is mg sine theta. This side is mg cosine theta. And at this point, I guess I can do step number four and write down Newton's second law equations. But I think uh, having written down this much, I'm remembering that um, this component of gravity should equal normal force so that in this direction there's no acceleration so that's uh, giving me enough to say okay normal force is mg cosine theta and uh, since all i wanted was the normal force i don't really need to finish the remainder of the standard strategy so i have this expression for the friction force my friction force is equal to coefficient times that mg cosine theta Okay, um, uh, let me do this. I, so there are a, a few different ways you can approach this question here. Um, you could uh, do a modified version of energy conservation. Um, what I feel like is maybe more conceptually accessible is for me to calculate the difference in the kinetic energy of the mass between um, what's here and what I already calculated for um, um, uh, for the frictionless case. So let me, and once I have that difference in the kinetic energy from what it should have been without friction and what it is with the friction, then I think uh, that'll give me a way to get at the magnitude of friction force. So that, that's the speed without the friction. So let me square it again <laughs> um, to get speed squared. I need to multiply that to the mass uh, times 1.6 and times one half. That's one half mv squared. So times 0.5, okay. So that's the kinetic energy. Um, let me call this uh, Ke naught. Uh, this is the would have been kinetic energy without friction. That's a 12 point, let me just keep a few extra significant figures, 175 a joule. That's what the kinetic energy should have been. But the real kinetic energy is given by this velocity here. So let me just do the calculation. One half times the mass, 1.6 kilograms times V squared. 
uh, 2.59 squared. So the actual kinetic energy is given by that. So uh, Ke with the friction is equal to uh, 5 point, let me keep some extra significant figures, 3, 6, 6, joule. So staring at these two, I can see the change in the energy uh, of minus, oh, can I, you know, I can't do this in my head. Let me just do subtract, 4.175 minus 6.8809. Uh, 6.809 joule. So this is uh, uh, the change of energy, or it's not really change of, well, I can say this. It's change of energy from the initial gravitational potential energy to what the final kinetic energy is. And for this change of energy, I'm going to say this is coming from work done by friction force. And uh, because the friction force is directly opposed to the direction of motion, the, so, you know, the, the work done by any force is this uh, dot product. And, uh, you know, technically it's F delta X times cosine theta, where theta is angle between the two vectors. But between the friction and the, the displacement, it's completely opposite direction. So this cosine theta ends up being just minus one. So the, the work done by friction, if you're talking about the magnitude, it should be the magnitude of the friction force times the just the displacement. So um, so this quantity here, I can say that delta E, its magnitude, <laughs> just trying to avoid the sign errors, is um, given by the friction force. Let me just write down mu mg cosine, and this is a different theta, that's a, this theta here, that's that 15 degrees. Don't confuse your angles. You know, always keep track of, yeah, let me just not even. <laughs> um. So that's a magnitude of friction force times, and here the displacement should be just the L, because that's uh, how far the, that, that's how far the mass moves and the friction is just directly opposed. So I should just say friction force times L, absolute value. Okay, uh, I mean, these are all positive uh, quantities. So I think uh, it's, uh, uh, the friction coefficient should be this. Whatever delta A is, absolute value, divided by all these things. I think they are all given numbers. So divide by mg cosine theta times L. So let me just work that out in a calculator and see where that gets me. So I'm just gonna um, multiply this by um, minus one <laughs> so that it's a positive quantity. Um, so divided by mass, oh, I don't have access to my numbers. Divide by mass, uh, 1.6 and divided by g, 9.8, divided by cosine of 15 degrees, okay, and still divided by L, 3. And you know, when you do these calculations in your calculator, you should uh, remember how your calculator does order of operation. I do division every single time because if I do multiply, then my calculator misunderstands me. Okay, so with that, I should get a unitless quantity and this number seems reasonable for a friction coefficient, 0 0.150, um, 0 point, uh, 150. So here my answer should be friction coefficient mu, mu is equal to 0 0.150. And I might, um, in case I made a calculator mistake, I might say uh, delta E divided by and g cos theta times l and, and you know it's good if it's okay if you have it it's okay if you don't have it um you know it's going to be included in my work eventually the main difference is um, whatever's included here you have incontrovertible proof that it was done within the oh time limit two minutes oh what's the name okay <laughs> all right i gotta do this quickly two minutes okay so I have this much energy at the 
bottom of the hill. So uh, I gotta take that and um, divide it by the friction force, which will be mu mg, no cosine theta. That'll give me the distance that it can slide. And just quickly do that in calculator and then 5.366 divide by 0 0.15 times the mass 1.6 times 9.8. Okay, that 2.28 uh, distance is equal to 2.28 meters. <laughs> Let me make sure I put that in within the time limit and I will, you know, organize my work when I have more time. Okay, I can organize my work now. So uh, what I was working out there was this. Um, so for part to see, um, what I'm looking to do is, okay, um, so the, so for part C motion, the block is sliding along a level plane. It's initially moving at some speed of V that's above, and it's going to eventually come to a stop at V final is equal to zero. So it has some kinetic energy here that uh, we worked out above, 5.366 Joule. Uh, by the way, this is one of the reasons to keep track of your work. Sometimes you don't know what will be useful later. Uh, that's going to end up as my final kinetic energy. I don't know. And oh, that F means friction, by the way, not final. <laughs> final kinetic at the end is equal to zero. So I have some change of kinetic energy. And that change of kinetic energy, I'm going to attribute it to the work done by friction force. Um, or the absolute value is that. And the absolute value of uh, work done by friction force, that should be the, the friction force times the displacement. Um, oh, so that's what I'm uh, looking to work out. So here, I guess the biggest thing to be careful about is working out the friction force. Sometimes people, um, you know, look at these expressions they've written before and forget what assumptions went into it. This is the friction force for the block on an incline. Um, so when the block is now on a flat ground, the normal force is mg, not mg cosine theta. So here, the friction force should be uh, the friction coefficient times the normal force, which is just uh, mg now, not mg cosine theta. Or it is mg cosine theta, but theta is zero. Uh, times d, yeah, so um, solving this for d, my d is equal to the, the change in kinetic energy. Here, that would be just uh, my initial kinetic energy, because my final, or in terms of the absolute values trying to avoid the sign errors, divided by uh, mu mg. So mu mg. And I'm pretty sure that is the calculation I did. Yeah, energy divided by mu mg. Yeah, so that should have given me 2.81. Um, 2.281 meters. And if you want, you can you know work out the unit. Uh, your kinetic energy has unit of joule, um, joule which is uh, uh, <laughs> newton times a meter. So it's a meter, or I think when you work it all right, kilogram times meter squared per second squared. And the denominator has unit of uh, kilogram times meter per second squared. So all these cancel out, except for one factor of meter, which is what we have here. Okay, so I think that's uh, all. Let me just uh, attach the work um, before I move on. Um, so I'm gonna attach the work by screenshots. I think that's the easiest thing to do here. And um, and and what I recommend for you is you should organize your work. Don't do what I do. <laughs> um, do what I preach. Because, um, um, I mean, so, you know, if somehow you uh, are out of time for other reasons and you can't organize it, all you can attach is the scratch work. I would still rather have it than nothing. A scratch work, I can try to understand what it means. Um, but sometimes, 
you know, it, it, the person writing the work means one thing, but when I'm looking at it, even with all my experience, sometimes I can't quite tell what you meant to say. So anyways, um, so that's it. Save work and continue. And I can review my work. Um, and yeah, I entered everything here. And um, how far does the block slide? Yeah, okay, good. <laughs> I didn't misunderstand the question. Sometimes I read it too fast and I misunderstand it. Although here, you know, I've written the question, so I, the moment I read A, I already kind of knew what C was saying. So, okay, so I think that's it for this question. Uh, sorry, I got the easier version. So um, your, <laughs> uh, some of the other questions will involve uh, conservation, conservation of energy and momentum, for example. There are some collision questions where you have to deal with that. And especially if you get more difficult to question, uh, this is my constant advice, which is that one, do your best and put something in your answer box that um, indicates for me what you completed within the 20 minute time limit. That's number one. Two, uh, attach your work. And somehow, if you want to take more time in organizing your work, if you're trying to figure out some things that you couldn't figure out within the 20 minute time limit, as long as you're doing that without the outside help, then that's fine. Um, so, so, you know, so put in something into the editor box and attach your work. And I'll, uh, as I'm grading it, I'll take into account what I can. Um, question of collisions on multiple directions. Um, so I think that's a question of if uh, there are any 2D collisions, right? I think there might have been one homework question that was like that. I, I'm i pretty sure I, um, I took those out because uh, I think I said uh, in one of the virtual class sessions that I won't ask those questions. Let me just uh, double check. Uh, oh, I, I think this is how I can double check. Let me do this. Review and I'm going to just drag this to my other screen. And let me just uh, scroll through all the questions. So, um, so there are some scenarios where it technically involves 2D motion, but um, so like this is one of the scenarios. Uh, and I think this one actually comes from a portable TA. So if you want, you can look for that uh, portable TA. Uh, let me paste it into here. Um, so like this is one of the scenarios um, where technically it's a 2D motion while this is sliding up. But when you read the question carefully and think through it, almost uh, everything in the question can be addressed with the uh, techniques involving 1D collision analysis. And you can um, also look at the portable T question where this actually comes from <laughs> to see how portable T handles it. Um, and let me just look through and make sure I don't have anything else. Uh, that yeah, there was one a uh, very old uh, midterm question that did involve collision in two D, um, but I I took it out because I remembered uh, promising people that I won't give uh, <laughs> give a two D collision question. Um, in your multiple choice questions, though, there is one question that does kind of involve two D. I think let me. Let me just double check to see. Um, I think uh, just gonna quickly scroll through here. Um, I I might have ta taken out even that one, but uh, let me just scroll through to see if I actually took it out or if I thought about taking it out and then didn't take it out. Okay, thirty more remaining. Almost there at the end. Mm. Ah, yeah. So this is one question that uh, in, in the multiple choice questions that does involve two D collision. Um, and <laughs> um, you know, multiple choice. If you see a difficult question and you're not quite sure what the answer is, um, you can always ignore it and skip it. Nine out of ten is um, perfectly fine score that will should get you um, a. So, so, um, so somehow, if you're unlucky enough to see this question and you're not quite sure how to work it out. Um, you can skip it. <laughs> um, but I think this is basically the only 2D collision question that was in any of the timed assessments. 
So, so I hope that addresses the question. I'm trying to get rid of that orange thing. How do I get rid of the orange? Okay. Um, yeah. So, okay, I got four minutes left. Oh, let me use four minutes this way. Uh, unless there are any other remaining questions. Any burning questions people have? No burning questions? What I wanted to use the time for was to see how quickly I can do multiple choice timed assessment and still hopefully get 10 out of 10 uh, if I just forego any kind of explanation whatsoever. Because a lot of times when I do this, um, part of me taking time is me, you know, saying stuff and explaining. Now, let's imagine I just don't bother with any explanation and just gonna go through this as quickly as I can. I'm just getting some writing instruments in case I need to write anything. Because writing things on computer screen takes time. So, okay, so let me just do that. I'm gonna retake this and I'm just gonna race again to myself to see how quickly I can do it. Okay. Oh, that's basically two same questions. Oh well. <laughs> That's gonna. That's nonsense. Uh, these are dynamically generated, by the way. All the distance. So I need four times the energy. That's a one half kx squared. So it should be four times. No. Well, this would have matched. That yeah, looks right. Yeah. This is also dynamically generated. 100 times, okay, so from momentum conservation. <laughs> Am I getting this question like three times? Uh, oh, wait, no, it's momentum. <laughs> All right, so momentum only doubled. <laughs> Good, okay. We almost selected this. Impulse and impulse is. Yeah, that's the answer. Um, 40 times that, that's approximately 8,000 divided by 3, 2. Uh, you know, that's close enough. I can't. These two are too close to each other. Doing this in my head, I might miss it. Yeah, I would have selected this, but this was correct. Oh, I had this question before. I think this was the answer. I remember what the answer was. Yeah, good. Okay. All right, so how much time did I... Yeah, three minutes. <laughs> Uh, uh, part of it is me just remembering writing the question, so, um, which, you know, definitely helps. Uh, and uh, let me submit it and see if I missed anything. When I do it this quickly, I might miss some stuff. Uh, we'll see. Ah, did I miss anything? Okay, so that's it. <laughs> I guess, uh, so, so yeah, uh, I think that uh, all that I wanted to demonstrate, um, let me know of any questions. Um, 